So welcome everybody to today's webinar, um, which is titled, as you can see, a MOOC approach for training researchers in developing countries. And this is actually the third in a series of Emerge Africa webinars, where we look into the current status of how African higher education institutions are making use of MOOCs. Now our presenters today are Andy Nobs and Ravi Murugazan. Um, and welcome to both of you. So Andy is a program officer in the capacity of research development and support for INASP, which is the international network for the availability of scientific publications. So INASP is an international development charity working with a global network of partners, which includes Africa, to improve access, production and use of research information and knowledge. So Andy's role covers several different projects. He supports the Journals Online project, which has helped develop open access platforms for journals in developing countries. He is also involved in the Author Aid project, which supports developing country researchers through writing workshops, grants, and an online mentoring scheme. In addition, Andy administrates and moderates INASP's online courses and is coordinating the development of a range of new online courses across INASP's different program areas. And we also have with us today Ravi, who has more than eight years of experience with Moodle, um, which is an open source online learning platform. He has also worked in the higher education, electronic design and scientific communication sectors. Ravi's work with INASP includes administering the INASP Moodle, creating and facilitating online courses, facilitating train the trainer workshops, and administering small grants. And as we saw in the text chat area, Ravi is based in India. So welcome Andy and Ravi and thank you so much for setting aside this time to speak to us today about this very interesting topic. Um, and I would like to hand over to Andy now. So Andy, over to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, great. Thank you. So thank you very much, first of all, to, to Emerge Africa for inviting us to do this webinar. And um, welcome, everybody who's just signing in. I see there's a good number of you. Um, this, this presentation is based on a paper we wrote, which has been published in the journal called Open Praxis, which is available, I think, as a link on the left-hand side of the screen. There's, a, there's more information if you go to that link and read the paper. It's fully open access, Creative Commons, so you can share and, um, and reuse as much as you like. Um, we've added a, a title, um, a subtitle for this presentation. Um, which is kind of a hook, which is, um, are MOOCs a realistic and sustainable way to train African academics? And we hope to be able to answer this question throughout the presentation by looking back at what we wrote in the paper and also adding some new information and interpretations. So um, this presentation is from, from myself and Ravi, who's based in India. So I'm going, to, I'm going to start off and we're going to share certain parts of the presentation. So just to quickly summarize what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to say quickly who we are, um, the problems that we're trying to address, the context of MOOCs in developing countries and the research that's been done on that so far. Ravi is going to then talk about the, the history of the course we've developed, where it started from. I'm then going to do mention how that course was upscaled to a MOOC and what was involved in that. We'll then talk about our experiences running the course and some of the interesting statistics from, from that course, the long-term impact from the surveys that we've done, and whether this approach is actually sustainable. So the actual focus of, of the paper is quite niche in the, um, from the perspective that it's talking about training researchers in particular. Um, but we think that it's got various different applications across different areas and different contexts. So in general, it's not just training, not just about training academics and researchers, but also students and adults in general, 
and it's about how this kind of training can be used in higher education contexts in developing countries and also in CPD, in continuing professional development. So this is what we're going to hopefully cover in our presentation. But I wanted to actually do a quick poll now, if we could. We thought it'd be fun to ask a couple of quick poll questions. And the first question is about your own experience of, of MOOCs. And we wanted to ask you about the, the last MOOC that you did, if you did one. So did you actually complete the last MOOC you took? So you get to choose between, yes, I completed the course. No, I didn't complete the course. And that, that's actually the case for me. I didn't complete the last one I took. Or I've never actually taken a MOOC. So it'd be really interesting to see your responses to that and compare that and see what kind of completion rate we have amongst our listeners. It's looking quite good so far. OK, so perhaps we'll look at that at the end. Um, it's actually more or less 50-50 between yes, I completed and no, I didn't. So that's really interesting. But we'll see that um, as that goes along. OK, so it looks like we've, um, we've settled on a, on a very even yes and no. So that's interesting. OK, so um, let's move on to, to what, um, what, who we are, what in ASP is. So we've already had a really good introduction, actually, from Catherine. So thanks for that. So I don't really need to talk too much about who in ASP are. We basically have um, a vision of putting research and knowledge at, at the heart of international development. And our mission is to support individual researchers and institutions in developing countries to produce, share and use that research knowledge to actually transform lives. The project that Ravi and I are involved in is called AuthRAID. And this is a global network of around 17,000 researchers. And we help researchers to publish and communicate their research so that that research knowledge can have an impact on development challenges and change lives. So the problems that we're trying to address, there are some of the things that developing country researchers face, some of them are quite constant, such as how to structure a research paper and things like research ethics, and other things are constantly evolving and developing, and we have to change our training as a result. So things like the publishing process, and this new phenomenon um, it's called so-called predatory journals. So these are, the, these are some of the challenges that we perceive that researchers have. So there is a, a general um, inequality in, in global research. The, the, the research output of African and Asian researchers generally dwarfs that of, of those in the global north, if you're talking about pub papers published in international journals. So these inequalities are some of the things that we're trying to help solve through the MOOCs that, that we have run. In the context of MOOCs in developing countries, we, for the paper we did, we, we did a brief literature review. And um, it's really interesting because I'm, I'm aware that in the last six months, this, is, this has changed quite a lot. So since we wrote our paper, we've had some interesting updates on, uh, on Google Scholar, which has shown that new research is coming out about this all the time. So this is constantly being updated in this field. But here are some of the basics that we found when we looked at what the literature said about MOOCs in developing countries. There wasn't really a lot out there that was written, but this is what we found. So participants in developing countries are generally more likely to complete MOOCs, especially when it comes to professional development. Academics, researchers, and health professionals are more likely to be MOOC participants than the general public. Obviously, there are significant challenges, such as internet connectivity, which we have to face all the time, and also digital literacy. And in general, MOOCs, because they're mostly hosted in the global north, tend not to consider developing country contexts and the needs of learners in developing countries.
So I'm going to have, hand over to Ravi now for the next section on course creation and content. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me uh, well. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about what the course is about. Uh, I, uh, okay. So the history of this course, uh, it, we, we ran it for the first time nearly uh, six years back. Uh, that was a pilot, and at that time, uh, I uh, I was I just joined uh, Inasp and uh, was working in the Autorate project. And there was this uh, need that we felt that we need to get into e-learning, and uh, the sort of the, the just uh, it, it started out with considering e-learning modules, you know, just standalone modules. But I uh, I, I thought we better to uh, develop a course, so um, uh, we worked on this, um, uh, and 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 we use Moodle because it's open source and uh, it's quite scalable. Uh, so the first course had about 30 uh, learners, so we did it with a university in Rwanda, um, and it, it went off well. Um, and then we, we made it more public, we said, now e-learning courses, we're going to offer it regularly. And even the first time we made it public, this was 2012, five years back, so we got a lot of applications, more than 300, I think. Uh, but we, we don't, yeah, that's good that there's demand for this course, but uh, we weren't uh, ready to really take in everyone, and MOOCs were just starting out at that time, I think, or were starting out in a big way, rather. Um, uh, so we, I think we didn't even consider just accepting everyone, and we even had a selection process, where, so it wasn't set out to be a MOOC anyway. Uh, so for a couple of years, we, we ran small courses with up to 50 learners. I think we ran about four or five of this course, the Authorway course, and a, a couple of times we we uh, made it, uh, we, we had a thematic version of the course for environmental health. So it was going on uh, as a regular feature. Uh, and also the facilitator has evaluated assignments in most of these courses. Um, then in uh, 2014, uh, again we put out a call for applications and this time we had a lot of uh, applications, more than 500. And we felt uh, braver, we had some experience and we had tried out peer assessment and so we decided to uh, make it a bigger course. We had more than 250 learners and uh, uh, we had, importantly, some writing activities uh, using the Moodle workshop tool which allows for peer assessment activities to be orchestrated. Uh, we saw uh, we, we saw a 68% completion rate which was a bit less than what we had been seeing with smaller courses where we used to say 80 to 90% rates. Um, uh, but still it wasn't too bad. Uh, so this was uh, kind of building block uh, for our MOOC approach uh, a year later. Um, so um, Andy will be talking more about how we scaled up to MOOC. So now I, I'm going to just talk a little more about the course itself. I think uh, these writing activities that include peer assessment are one of the central features of the course because you, you expect any course to have some content. It is there content in the form of videos or uh, interactive text-based content or even PDFs, there is some content and uh, yeah, so uh, I think that the challenge is to, I guess, to have activities that, that scale well or, or that, that make it an engaging course. So I think uh, the peer assessment activities have been working well for us and uh, I gave a talk at this, uh, the Moodle uh, conference in a couple of years back on how we do peer assessment. So if you're interested in this particular aspect of our course, uh, you could uh, uh, go and look up this talk on, on YouTube. Um, and then, uh, so after that, after our success with the mini MOOC, as we began to call it, uh, that was three years back, uh, we, we uh, worked on a second, the second version of this uh, research writing course. Uh, and again, I, did, I wouldn't say that we did this with the idea of making a MOOC, but it was there, I think, the idea that we would run even bigger courses. But, uh, we improved it mainly because we had some new, uh, our own internal sort of knowledge of how, what are the constraints faced by researchers in developing countries uh, in communicating their research. So the content was really, it was a new version of the course, uh, new content, although some of it was based on the previous course. So uh, make it more contextualized to the developing country audience. Uh, so this time we used uh, an open source tool called EXE Learning. Uh, which is good, which is very, very good to create the standalone interactive content that you can put up on a website, that you can provide in a downloadable format. And some of you may be familiar with uh, H5P, which is, uh, I think, which was released a year or two back. That's really um, uh, 
taken some of the e-learning world by storm. It's, it's really good, but this was before those days. So I, it was what was available um, and uh, that's what we use for the lessons. And then there we have a number of quizzes, um, check your understanding quizzes in every section of the course. There are writing activities that, um, that have peer assessment. Of course, there are discussion forums. And we, from the beginning, we have had, uh, we've um, tried to make the platform, our Moodle platform and the course as light on bandwidth as possible. Uh, so our course, and nowadays we have some optional videos in the course and we are seeing and well, when you know, when we started out six years back, so you know, that's quite a long time back. And nowadays, we are seeing a greater uh, demand or even uh, expectation uh, in terms of videos. Uh, so we have uh, some videos in the course, some content videos, and some uh, discussion videos. I think uh, Andy will be talking about that later. Uh, but otherwise, the content is uh, low bandwidth, and even the Moodle theme we've used a clean theme in Moodle. It's fairly light. Um, and even our platform, I think it works well. I regularly, uh, or when Andy and I travel, uh, and we're in Africa, and we go to South Asia now and then, and we sometimes there's a course going on, and I, I found our Moodle site to be fairly fast, uh, relatively. It's never given a big problem. Uh, so that's been our uh, an important part of our work. Um, and uh, we ran the first MOOC a couple of years back, uh, so after we developed the second version of our course. Um, so that will be in the uh, in the section that Andy will be talking about. So a little bit about the quiz quizzes that we use. So I spoke about the peer assessment. There is a, a talk on YouTube about that, and even there is a talk on YouTube about how we have used the Moodle quizzes. I, I gave a talk at the at the uh, at another iMoot. Uh, uh, so uh, I think the quizzes that we use can be considered formative assessment. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't. I'm not, I'm not so much of an education expert to say conclusively uh, if, if they are, but I think so. I think they work that way with, we have a passing score, but learners can make multiple unlimited attempts actually on the quiz. Uh, and it's actually just at the level of, uh, you know, knowledge. It's not a very high level quiz. Uh, uh, so, but it's, it's working well, especially in the MOOC context, because uh, these quizzes, uh, you know, they're automatically graded. They're made up of multiple choice questions and they're part of the completion criteria of the course. Uh, so we have um, in the MOOCs that we ran uh, uh, so far, uh, I think well, some of them have had, uh, most of them have had five quizzes of this kind and one had seven because it was a slightly bigger course. Uh, this is the home page of our Moodle site. Um, it's the clean theme. We have, we have really spent uh, nothing at all in, in theming or, or doing anything. We just use the off-the-shelf theme. We put a logo. Uh, the home page has a bit of text. We now and then we wonder, well, should we make it something look, yeah, look, making it look a little better? But um, it's uh, it's really just Andy and me doing the much of the Moodle stuff. Uh, we don't have a development team for Moodle. We don't have a team uh, teamwork, nothing of that kind. But we do have someone who takes care of, who does some liaisoning with our IT team to do the server work. Uh, but we don't do any development or customization. We just use the Kind of a stock model. Now we are on Moodle uh, 3.1. Um, in case you're wondering, um, we've upgraded over time. We started out 2.1, 2.5, 2.6, and 3.1, which is a long-term release. Uh, it's working well. Uh, uh, now uh, this is part of the course homepage. Uh, it's a long course, uh, so you can't cap you can capture the whole thing in one screenshot. But gives a sense, I think, of what uh, it's just a two-column layout. Um, with the left, there are some blocks, like some of which you see here, people, uh, search forums, online users, and uh, the rest is, uh, is uh, content split up into sections. Um, there are discussion forums uh, and literature review is the first uh, uh, section in the course, and it's either five sections or seven, depending on what we cover in the course. Um, uh, so, uh, in the previous, on the previous page, you saw that online users block. Uh, well, when I took that screenshot, it was only me. Uh, but when the course is going on, we, uh, I think the, in the last course we had, uh, we touched a record of more than 100 online users that we saw at the same time. Uh, but this, uh, I, I, I took this snapshot when we had at some point about 50 uh, learners. So, uh, so I think uh, it, I like that block. It gives a sense of you know, there are a lot of people uh, online at the same time, especially in a MOOC. And we use a survey, this is one of the inbuilt uh, Moodle surveys 
on connected versus separate knowing. And every time we run the survey, uh, we find that uh, there is a tendency or, or more people are connected learners. You can't see this graph. I mean, you can't read the text very well, but the, but the kind of the, the square, the blue square on the left, that represents uh, connected learning. Uh, and the one on the, to, its, uh, to its right is separate learning. So there is a little more participants uh, agree uh, with the connected learning approach or, or, or they, are, you know, they, they like it better. So it, it is sort of a reason for our, it adds kind of justification for our forums for trying to make a sort of community of learners uh, as opposed to anonymous people uh, just, uh, you know, uh, posting randomly on the forums or something. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a bit about the course. Now I'll uh, um, back to Andy for how we uh, made this into a MOOC. Uh, Andy? Okay, thanks Ravi. Yes, yeah, so now talking about how we actually upscaled the existing online course. Um, I've, I've put in a few pictures um, during the presentation and this is a, a recent competition we, we ran on the course for participants to send in pictures either of themselves doing the online course or doing their research and in some cases we have both so in, in, uh, in this case here I think this is a, a Catherine from um, Kenya who sent us a picture of us of her doing both so um, some things to consider then um, when upscaling to a MOOC we had to think about and change the slide. How do you engage hundreds or thousands of adult learners? So Ravi has all already mentioned that there's just there's just two of us that are running a course effectively. So how do you how do you work with thousands of people? How do you deal with questions on the content? So Ravi is the um, the subject facilitator of the course, and to an extent, I I know a bit of the content, but to actually respond to those questions on the, the, the subject of, of research and publishing is obviously a huge challenge. And then, of course, how do you deal with technical issues? This is, um, this is a, an exercise we did at the start of the last course, in fact, the last two courses, where we provided a pin board for people to mark their location on a map. And it was very popular, and it shows the geographical spread of the course, which is really interesting. For the last course, we happen to have quite a, a huge number of Nigerians on the course. So you can see that concentration of pins around Nigeria and Ghana, but also, um, also in Kenya, India, Sri Lanka as well. One of the main things we did, one of the, um, the, the innovations was to bring on a team of what we called guest facilitators. So we knew that we would struggle to accommodate so many learners. In the last course, we had 3,000 people start, begin the course. And so we were very lucky to be able to draw on a team of volunteers from both our network of trainers, from the, the research writing training that we do in, in our partner countries, which um, is Tanzania, Ghana, Sri Lanka, Vietnam. So we could, we could call on those trainers there, but also our online mentoring network. We, we put out a call for or um, experienced people to, to join us on the course and act as these guest facilitators. Now the role of these facilitators was to basically police the forums and answer any questions and encourage people to get involved in the discussion. And we, we found it worked really well. Here's a, this is a screenshot from our, our page on Moodle which lists the guest facilitators. So as you can see there from all over the world, um, overwhelmingly in developing countries. We also got into the habit, habit over the last three courses of promoting course participants from the previous course into actual facilitators. So those who have been particularly active or done particularly well on the previous course, we upgraded them into guest facilitators and they were really keen to do that. They were really enthusiastic um, to, get, to get more involved. And here's a, here's a great quote from one of the um, previous participants, that the replies from guest facilitators is a course in itself. So just that, that, expert, that expert knowledge and experience of having done the course already, course participants found that really, really helpful. And as a result, we had some really interactive forum participation. 
So this is the, the pedagogical model that we, we, we based our, our the structure of the course on in the end, really. Now, when we, were, when we were looking at the course and scaling it up to a MOOC, we had some ideas on the additional things we needed to do. And there were lots of pedagogical models out there. But we, were, we couldn't do anything really complicated. We couldn't really look into doing anything around the sort of connect, connectivist thinking of using lots of different activities and taking people onto different platforms. So we wanted something that was quite simple. And when, when I, I came across this model, um, we, we saw that it was quite a, a simple model and kind of fit with a lot of the things that we were doing already. And it's kind of helped us to structure um, the way we were doing things and how we needed to improve the course further. So the, this is Garrison's community of inquiry model that we use. And a lot of you may be familiar with it because I think it was actually uh, mentioned in, in one of the presentations last week at least. So there are three three presences: um, social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. And we approach this in quite a simple way. So these these are what we consider our simple steps towards these three different types of presence. So first of all, there was this idea of teacher presence, and what we started to do um, around the, the second MOOC that we did is we started to add some short videos at the start of the course, just introducing who we were as the, as the, the two main people uh, running the course. We, we added in these just very short videos, just so people could see us face to face, see what we were like, see that we were real people. And that seemed to go down quite well. Um, and we, in, la in later courses, we've also added um, a video discussion, which I'll talk about in a moment. Each week we do a very friendly weekly update, just to update people on how things are going, what scores they're getting, what's coming up in, in the next week, and to really encourage people. Um, I got a really great comment actually from our, par our participants of, um, of the last course saying that it was the first time they'd seen a smiley emoticon be used by a facilitator um, on on an online course so we're you know we're quite informal and um and we use smiley faces and sometimes that can go down really well it's just these these small things that can have a have an impact on some learners and of course there's the the activity of the facilitators in the forums can really add value to um to the course when people know that their questions are going to be asked by the the course facilitators this is some um, concept also of cognitive presence, and this is one of the most difficult things that we um, we found drawing out of the actual theory. The actual course design itself and the use of the content can help with this kind of deeper learning that needs to happen. We found that that can quite easily happen through controversial subjects. I think um, there's this um, theory that it, you have to trigger um, deep learning through through trigger, triggering events and. We, unfortunately, in, in the course content, we have some quite controversial ideas around, um, not controversial ideas, but subjects around things like research ethics, around plagiarism, authorship, predatory journals. So we've always got plenty of content on hand to be able to encourage discussions around these really hot, hot topics. And we also, as Ravi has mentioned, we have a, a couple of peer assessment exercises which um, is really good for encouraging self-reflection and putting the learner in the shoes of the assessor. And we've got some really um, good feedback on, from a lot of um, participants on how useful they find that exercise to help them think much deeper about what they're doing. And of course, there's social presence. And we did find that the facilitators really got the discussion going in the forums. We try to keep those forums as structured as possible. So rather than having just a free for all big forum, we, we had a forum for each week so that people could discuss that topic um, of, of that week. And we tried to make the content so that it would invite further further questions. I think we, we found that um, the, the forum interaction on our course was very high compared to what the literature said other course, other MOOCs were, were like. So we're really pleased with the way that the, um, the discussion forums went. 
So a, a couple of um, bits of qualitative feedback we've had, which, which show some of the interesting things about the interaction. Many participants said there was a real value in cross-cultural interaction, which you would only really get on a, on a large online course, on an international MOOC. One person said that it's really useful to get different perspectives from different cultures and help them think outside, outside the box to an extent. That was a, a, a participant from Nepal. And of course, there's also the, um, the value of peer interaction and peer assessment. And it's, it's, it's good to be able to, to get a response from another participant. And we found that there's lots of interaction between peers on the course, not just between peers and facilitators. And this person from Tanzania also fed back that it was a really great experience to mark each other's papers and come up with recommendations. <coughs> so just to say quickly about the, um, the video discussions that we've added to the course over the last couple of courses we've run. This is quite an experimental thing for us. And we used Google Hangouts. And initially, we were just having a discussion amongst the the facilitators of the course just to run through the topics that have been discussed in that week so that we can look at the most common questions that were asked and respond to them. In the last course we, we invited course participants and we see this here on the screen. One of this is a screenshot. This is one of the course participants actually asking a question, a follow-up follow-up question from the course. Now we felt that these these discussions they went well and they got lots of really positive feedback on from the participants on the course. They were recorded live, but only um, broadcast to the participants and shared afterwards, because we had quite a lot of um, technical problems having discussions with um, across three or four different continents. So they were quite problematic, but the, the actual recordings were went down really well um, between the participants on the course. And we had this really good quote from one of the course participants, which I think backs up one of the theories of the community of inquiry model about facilitator presence. They said it, it wasn't just useful because of the, the topics that were discussed, but it was nice to put faces and voices to some of the, some of the names of the facilitators, and it gave them a sense of nearness. So it's really great to see that, that, that these videos actually helped. Even some of the really short videos helped the participants just to get an, an idea of um, what the personality of the facilitator was like, and it actually felt helped them feel more near to the to the facilitators. So that was great. So I'm, I'm handing back to Ravi now to talk about how the courses went and some some reflections um, that we've had on the courses so far. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so first, some reflections before I go on to the uh, sort of the outcomes or the results of the courses. So, um, uh, first, what went well? Uh, we've offered uh, four MOOCs over the past two years, and they have been on a fairly uh, regular uh, schedule. Um, so, uh, I think that's a good thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, when when there is a MOOC that's announced, it's not clear is it going to be offered again. Um, so I think in that we've tried to make this a regular event. Um, uh, guest facilitators, I think that's uh, uh, it's been uh, just just worked out really well for us. And as I was just uh, uh, you know, in the chat with uh, you know, the text chat, I was responding to some questions about the guest facilitators. So it's been actually easy for us to get these guest facilitators because we have a very large network. And it's not even like we ask everyone to apply for a position because we have lots of people. Uh, it, that might have been like the level of a MOOC in terms of the interest then. Uh, but we know uh, we have our own, the names, you know, some of them are high performing mentors or they are very active in the community forum. So I think uh, uh, the first time we asked some of them uh, if they'd like to be a guest facilitator, most of them agreed. And then after that, uh, many of them, I think uh, in every course, we have about, about half the, we have usually about close to 30 guest facilitators, about 10 to 15. Uh, they are, they've also been guest facilitators the, the, the co in, the, in the previous course. So they actually like to do this. Uh, uh, so we, yeah, and then we don't really have to get a whole new set of guest facilitators every time. Uh, we also have some partners in the university partners in, uh, 
in some countries and we we had some guest facilitators from there uh, because they are working on embedding auth rate training i'll talk a little bit about that later uh, and we also uh, had some participants from a previous MOOC who were guest facilitators and they did well. So it's working out well and uh, I think that's really one of the uh, you know, very important parts of the course. Uh, EXC learning, uh, I think it's worked well, um, but you know, some, you know, the, uh, this is a technology and technology is, uh, they, they keep, uh, you've got to keep up. Uh, I'm not sure, now we're not using this anymore, we are using the Moodle book. Uh, uh, the tool and the and H5P, uh, but so far it's been working okay. But learners expect PDF copies, which EXE does not provide. Uh, so we might have a PDF copy of the whole course uh, this time, um, the next time that is. And and quizzes, you know, this has actually been surprising to me. Uh, I made these quizzes thinking, well, let's put some quizzes, and I didn't have that much time, so I made made some quizzes just at the knowledge or recall level. Uh, yet they have worked well and many participants like them, uh, they find them engaging uh, and I think this gives an incentive to actually read the lesson closely because it's hard to pay attention to just content whether it's a video or, uh, or text. And finally Moodle has been there, it's been there with us from the beginning for six years, we've upgraded it, yes, but it's been the same site and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really a, an excellent platform. Um, so I think if you're in doubt about which platform to use, I would definitely recommend Moodle. Uh, yeah. So uh, and some feedback on this uh, on what's the most useful part, mostly about sort of the quizzes. So lessons, or always lessons or content is appreciated. Quizzes also score highly, with 78% uh, saying this was um, one of the most useful parts. Peers' Mac really is not that much, but I believe this ratings improved a bit in our most recent MOOC. Uh, so this is one of the challenges, which I'll come to a bit later. Uh, forums and well, the pre and post is just something we have for monitoring and evaluation. So both lessons and weekly quizzes. Uh, I think the message I want to I want to uh, the message from here is it's it's easy to make a quiz at the at the recall or knowledge level, and it is appreciated by the participants. So uh, that's uh, really what I've learned from this. Um, some challenges in this, uh, in in our in our approach, uh, peer assessment. It's uh, it's all it's um, the way it, it helps everyone get some feedback on their work. But how can the overall quality of feedback be improved? Because you know it's easy to imagine how they vary a lot. Some people get some really good feedback. Some people get very perfunctory feedback from someone who just did it just because they had to complete this activity to get credit for it. Um, so it is, it is uh, a challenge. How can it be done? We, you know, it's, we do, we make some minor changes to the course or to the instructions, uh, but it's a lot of it's work in progress. And the flow of these activities, and particularly the rigid deadlines that come that are part of peer assessment activities, they confuse and frustrate learners. And every in every course, Andy has a lot of uh, learners who are asking. Uh, is responding to them saying why you know the deadline was yesterday and we can't extend the deadline because it's now in the assessment phase we can't change it without affecting the flow for everyone uh, so it, it you know, this is, happens in every course uh, our Moodle while it's great uh, it has its drawbacks there are just a lot of settings we have a course with many lessons many uh, quizzes some other activities peer assessment and uh, it is uh, it's not just some content and forums it's a lot more than that uh, so there are more opportunities for errors and even a quiz has lots of settings. You know, forum has a lot of settings, subscription settings and and uh, whatnot, you know. Uh, permissions and often permissions get messed up for some reason. Uh, yeah, so um, and it's also difficult to get feedback from those who drop out. Uh, we always get feedback from the completers but very little from those who leave. Um, and we're looking into making the course more accessible. We have uh, seen some learners taking the courses on their on the course on their mobile, although it's not particularly mobile friendly. But the platform, the theme, and model is mobile friendly, is responsive. But on the whole, the course is not optimized for mobiles. Uh, but yet we know that we get feedback saying that some people are happy with the mobile experience. But you know, a lot more needs to be done. Offline now with the Moodle app and the Moodle desktop app, they, they think there are more offline capabilities. So uh, something to explore and translations. The course is an English course, and the and the, and the facilitation is in English. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something uh, we we've been thinking of. We do have a Spanish version of the course, 
which is not part of this presentation we have that's taken on its own life we have run MOOCs in the in Latin America uh, but that's something our colleague is involved in Andy and I are not so much involved in that uh, but making it a French course for example or Arabic so this is something in the long run um, our results I see Andy has put a nice uh, picture in here uh, uh, so the completion rate uh, over the four MOOCs, we've had more than 7,000 participants and we've seen a 50.3 uh, com average completion rate uh, and for women it's slightly higher, uh, 52 percent. Um, and it is also uh, statistically significant as we reported in our paper, in our open practice paper. Uh, we had most participants from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 53 percent. But also, the gender balance has been poorest in this region. In other regions, it's around 50 or even 60 percent. Latin America, I think it's well over 50 percent. Um, so that's something that stood out because in one way, we are, you know, the, the, there is women complete the course more. And I think um, the average participation rate of the 7,000 participants, about 45 percent were women, I think, or 45, 46. Uh, but in, from Africa, it's been lower. Um, uh, so there is a, a question I'd like to introduce at this point, uh, uh, a poll, uh, if uh, Catherine could uh, pull that up for us, that'd be good. Okay, uh, I think it should be up now. Um, in your opinion, or even in your knowledge or research, it's not just opinion, I think, uh, which of the following, which one of the following might have the greatest impact on the completion rate in a MOOC? Uh, so, I'd like to know what you think. You can only choose one, even if you feel all of these are important, but which one do you think or feel? Uh, all right, we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, uh, responses coming in. All right, uh, so it's quite evenly spread with four to five, uh, um, or uh, keeps changing a bit. Uh, it looks like, assuming it's closed now, um, I think a lot of you say engaging activities. I see six uh, votes for that, and equally split for well designed content and brand value of the certificate. For, yeah, I, I agree, you know, sort of the brand value of the certificate is it's really a big. Uh, uh, yeah, it has a lot of appeal. Uh, and five have said participants feeling valued in the course. I actually like this spread. I, I was hope, I thought this was going to be a leading question, but I think it wasn't. Uh, okay, we could close the poll. Um, and I asked this because I think what, uh, oh wait, uh, okay, maybe I'll show this slide first. I think what we offer in our course is, uh, I wouldn't say is the most well-designed content or the most engaging activities. But I think there is a sense of participants feeling valued uh, because uh, uh, we have these guest facilitators going back to that and we have the forums and, and we try to design the forums in such a way that uh, you know there is a meaningful activity. We split the forum into different topics. Uh, so uh, we asked and this was in the third MOOC I think. We, uh, when we asked this question, uh, this was a question, whenever I posted a question on the discussion forum, I got a useful response from a member of the course team or a course participant. So apart from the 30 percent who said, uh, I don't know, uh, so you can take that out, but most of the others have agreed with this statement. So they, uh, they get useful responses when they post questions. I think that's a really, uh, uh, you know, that differentiates our MOOCs perhaps from these uh, kind of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, some MOOCs where you just post on the forums, you don't know who's going to respond or is anyone going to read it. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think this is one result. Uh, and this is a slide showing the African participation. Um, so Nigeria, we had nearly a thousand learners in the most recent MOOCs, which are one fourth of the audience. So uh, it is, I think, yeah, we're pretty popular in Nigeria. and the, and the Highlighted uh, numbers are the completion rate in Egypt and Somalia. They're pretty low. Uh, uh, we're not sure why, but it could be a language issue, or it could be that in Egypt, for example, they actually expect more, you know, MOOCs of the edX or Coursera kind. Arts are fairly basic MOOCs. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, I think so I should move on. Um, so in our open practice paper, there are a couple of uh, 
we found a uh, correlation between forum posting and course completion. It was pretty a very strong correlation. 83% uh, of those who made at least one post uh, completed the course. So uh, I think, and also they, as we know, they also get responses to their posts. So uh, I think the forums are kind of working well. Um, impact, I, I'll hand over to Andy now. Okay, thank, thanks Ravi. Um, just one thing that I didn't um, address in my, my previous section because I was losing my voice slightly. Um, th there's also the, the problem of addressing technical issues. And this is something that we discovered in our, our first MOOC that was going to be a big issue because we received lots and lots of emails. And from the second MOOC that we did, we decided not to give out our email address because it was just so much hard work keeping on top of the emails. And instead we had um, an open forum, an open technical queries forum, which allowed us to, to keep those queries in one place. But it also meant that a lot of the participants actually helped each other with those problems. Um, and pointed out to each other where they should go and how they should complete activities. So that was really good. So everyone could help each other. It's more of a collaborative exercise, helping each other to, yeah, yeah, and um, the crowdsourcing, the tech help, exactly. So um, so that was a really interesting finding. Um, moving on to, to impact then, um, this is actually a researcher from Somalia who, who completed our course. Um, so talking about some of the things that have come out of the course afterwards we've done a few surveys and we found some interesting things and we found that a lot of people are reporting that they've gained a lot from the course they've improved their confidence and they've actually published papers as a result of the course which is one of the the objectives the goals really that we're trying the skills that we're trying to build to help people communicate their research so we've got this impact study that's coming out soon and um, i just wanted to pick up one of the results of it it compares three different types of the support we offer. So we offer an intensive online course, um, which is heavily facilitated and um, tailors the learning to a much smaller group of around 15 to 20 people. And we have an online mentoring system which matches people up one to one. And we've got very positive results from all of these different interventions. It's just worth comparing that obviously you'd expect MOOCs to be much lower because you don't have the tailored support, but it's still pretty high. 36% of MOOC participants reported that they had used their skills to publish a paper in a year after the course. Um, if you want to find out more about the online mentoring, um, please take a look at um, our AuthorAid website. We basically match up um, researchers with more experienced um, researchers. And also, um, one of the results of that survey that we did, it, the actual perceived impact from the participants of those three different um, types of intervention, and we, we had a four-point scale from minus one to plus three, plus three showing a strong positive effect. And you can see that the, the feedback on the MOOCs was really high, so people perceived that they were much more confident, they had much more knowledge of the understanding of the publishing process or preparing papers or the quality of their writing as a result of the course, and much more so than very tailored um, uh, support, which was very interesting. So although the actual results of the course didn't show as much impact as the other types of support, the, the, the confidence after the course was very, very high. So we, 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 we thought that was really great. Here are some, some quotes from course participants, well, some, some positive quotes that we pulled out. So we have people saying that they, after the training, they were able to use their skills to use their research and publish it. So before the, before the training, they had this data, they didn't know how to use it. And since then, they've been able to publish. Um, another person says that it's positively affected almost every aspect of their academic life, which is um, a glowing reference. Um, it also helped them to teach others. And then the third, third quote saying that, again, it helped them to improve their confidence level of, of approaching the writing process and also helping their colleagues. So that's great to see. Now, Ravi is going to talk about whether this approach is actually sustainable. 
Fine. Thanks, Andy. Um, so what is sustainability? It's a word that's bandied around a lot. Uh, but I'm trying to kind of uh, try to write it out, say uh, what it means for us, at least one meaning. So uh, it's that we, uh, we are able to hand over the course to others and support them in running it while they have sort of increasing confidence, reduced dependence and contextualize their course. Um, this is part of the work that we do uh, with some of our university partners. So in three countries, our university partners have, uh, are, have been interested in running the auth rate online course. Um, so uh, they've been doing this for a couple of years and with some additional elements, uh, such as workshops, writing clubs, and mentoring. And we even had a grant recipient in Nigeria run a small course and then followed by a pretty big course with about 200 to 300 participants. And that was with no financial support from us. Uh, so uh, that was very interesting to see uh, how, how she did it. Um, with our partners, we, we offer more financial support, or these days more advisory support. Now, uh, so this is on our blog. You can find some information on what our um, uh, what our grant recipient in Nigeria did, and there is a case study about our em the embedding work at institutions, embedding how we have worked on embedding this particular course at uh, our partner universities in uh, in Africa and Asia. Um, well, but the thing is, uh, it's to to kind of uh, talk briefly about how it's going. Well, it's it's going well in terms of uh, the facilitation to some extent, but there is still a lot of support that is uh, needed in terms of the technical aspects of, of, of setting up the course and uh, moderating it and doing the data analysis with or, or you know using the learning analytics to find out who is dropping out, who has completed the course. We find that capacity or skills are lacking for this, but uh, the subject area facilitation and just the uh, interest and the demand is 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 sort of in place. Uh, so it's a lot of work in progress and it's something that I'm, I'm involved in this year. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's just, I would say it's, uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, sustainability. We are actually handing over the course. It's, it's, you know, you can zip up a Moodle course into one file and put it on another on Moodle site. And so we've made progress in all those fronts. Uh, but we're not, you know, we're not yet reached a point where we can say people are running it independently without our support, and it's going great. Uh, so we're still in the process of supporting them. Right. Um, okay. So back to Andy for uh, the conclusions. Okay. So um, this is this is a picture from um, some of our course participants in Nigeria that they sent in. So I'll try to. Try to to conclude on all of the all the things that we've we've talked about, but um, please do ask more questions um, if we have time. That is. So, attempting to to summarise all this information that we've given you. So, obviously, um, that you can have a high completion rate for a MOOC, and and we're aware that um, fifty percent completion rate is very high for for a massive open online course. Um, it's particularly high for, for women participants, and it's particularly high for those that actually engage in the forum. So those are interesting findings, and um, there's more information on this in the paper that we wrote and how it compares to other MOOCs. Um, another finding is, um, if we can run a MOOC, then so can you. And um, Ravi has just given some examples uh, of links about how we've worked with other organizations, institutions in Africa and Asia on running these MOOCs themselves. So it, it can be lo quite low cost using a platform such as Moodle, and it can be reasonably easy to set up. But if you're going to think about scaling up to a MOOC, you're probably going to need um, to look at volunteers and further help. And um, the, 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 the case of the, um, the Nigerian uh, Yabatek um, example, where they ran this course as a MOOC, is interesting because um, the organizer of it had to answer lots of queries and um, had to spend a lot of time answering queries on email and on phone. So you, you do need that additional um, capacity. Um, so what, what we believe is that MOOCs in developing countries can be successful. Um, but you have to think about what, what what's the right content. Is it tailored at the right level? Is it tailored to those working in low bandwidth environments? So we've had to think about those who are suffering the most um, internet outage. So we always think of people in countries we work in, such as Somalia and Sierra Leone, who are really going to struggle with some of this high bandwidth video content. 
So it's pitching it at the right level, um, whether you have the right pedagogy, and of course, if there is a demand. And when we think about why our courses have been successful, um, you know, there's, there's stuff around content and pedagogy and platforms, but whether there is actually a need for that training. And we think that there is a, a big need for this kind, this kind of training and capacity building, which is why the courses have been so popular and why there's been such a high completion rate. And finally, um, we believe that MOOCs can have long-term impact. So for individuals, if the course content is tailored to their audience and the audience has a specific need, then the, the, court, the MOOCs can have an impact. And at an institutional level, they can also have an impact if, if um, there is buy-in and, and commitment from, from developing country institutions. And if, if the individuals and institutions come together on these MOOCs in developing countries, working together, then those MOOCs really can have a long-term impact, as we found with our group of guest facilitators who come from all over the world, from many continents. When you get a, a group of people coming together, things can be really successful and can make a difference. So that's, um, I think we've kind of gone over our time slightly. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hand back to Catherine now and see if there are any other questions. Thanks very much, Andy and Ravi. That's really been a very interesting and comprehensive presentation. And I think you have pretty much uh, answered all of the questions between the two of you, um, whoever was not presenting verbally at the time. Um, I think the only one that went past um, was Olufemi was one of um, the screenshot that you had in your presentation of the virtual conferencing room. Um, which platform do you use for that? Is that for the uh, the video discussions? Yes, he was wanting to know what platform you used for those video conferencing, video discussion sessions, oh, yes, because yes. he was quite interested for the to see the participants being displayed as small thumbnails at the bottom of the screen. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um, that was um, Google Hangouts that we used, um, which is free and it works really, really well. And we've, we've looked at other paid services, but I think that, um, that Google Hangouts has worked quite well for us, although it does it doesn't work in some countries such as China, which can be a problem. Great, thanks Andy. And then um, I see uh, Olafemi had one more question which he's just put there. How has how have your courses helped with um, CPD? Uh, continued yeah, I, I just wrote out a response to. Uh, okay. I just wrote out a response to that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. It, it, since uh, so, research writing and publishing are important for academics. So uh, our course is about that. Uh, so I think it is in the theme of continuing professional development. Although, if the question is about credits or for, you know what is the formal aspect, we don't offer any credits. It's not accredited. Um, uh, yeah. So it's just informal CPD. And uh, I could Thanks, take Bobby. a few more questions at this time. Um, there is a question on, uh, are we taking more questions or should we wrap up? There's a question on whether I think Moodle is suitable for MOOCs. And um, I think we found, we think if it is, we think that it can handle a large number of people. Of course, the maximum that we've, we've kind of dealt with is three to 4,000 people. Um, and we, we, we have had to upgrade our, our server to a reasonably, a reasonable capacity. Ravi, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that. Yeah, it's great, but it's ultimately a tool. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a platform, and it's about how you use it, and uh, uh, it's about the skills to administer and develop courses. So those are the critical things. Uh, um, yeah. 
Thanks, Ravi. And I see Alice has just typed in a question here saying what might be required to move the MOOC into a more extended CPD program? That's a good question. And that's something that we're currently considering through the, um, the latest study that we're going to release on this, because I've, I've just mentioned about the, the online mentoring that we also do. And we're trying to move these things as close as possible. So we're trying to recommend at the end of the course that course participants sign up for mentoring as well. And um, so we have also have this free online mentoring system um, on our website. And we found, and we're going we're gonna to talk about this more in the study that we release. Um, we find that we that the participants can learn the skills in the online courses in the MOOC. It's only through um, that mentoring that they can put those skills truly into, into practice. Of course, there are there are parts of the course which help them. Um, such as we have we have a, a peer assessment activity which helps people in writing an abstract. So it helps them actually try out those skills. But it's the um, the one to one mentoring that we try to encourage after the course, and, and also peer mentoring which helps people put those skills into practice. Ravi, I didn't know if you had anything else to say say about that. Um, no, that's, that's good. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. There's also a question about WhatsApp, um, which is an interesting one. And um, I, I'll just quickly, quickly answer that because the, um, the article that Ravi referenced, um, um, Fun Malay from Yabatek in Nigeria, she mentions um, WhatsApp in in that interview and um, we found that after a couple of the online courses we've done um, there's been a, a, a discussion that's built up on WhatsApp a kind of a post course discussion for people to con continue talking and continue um, discussing some of the ideas and, and collaborating and um, that's kind of happened spontaneously without us actually um, encouraging it You're right. It doesn't actually do live. I don't think it does live voice in the group. So, we've what's actually happened in the in the WhatsApp group is we've arranged separate Google Hangouts that have come uh, for in order to do um, video discussions. Great. Thanks, Andy and Ravi. Um, we have definitely packed a lot into this session. And your presentation has been excellent. Um, you've covered a lot of aspects and you've fielded a lot of questions. Um, but if there are more questions, they can definitely be posted into the Facebook group. I've just pasted the link there um, where you can continue this discussion or ask a new question that can be followed up um, by Andy and Ravi if, if you're open to that. <laughs> So thanks very much um, to both of you for taking us through this today and for everybody that has joined us from the varying parts around the globe. This has been an excellent session. And just a quick reminder to uh, everyone here that we have another webinar coming up uh, in a few days' time, which will be the next in this series. Um, let's just paste the link there. Um, find it for you quickly. Okay, somebody's going to paste it there. And um, please sign up for the, the next session. And remember that this session has been recorded, as uh, Jakob mentioned at the start. It's also been live streamed. So if there's anything that you missed out or would like to refer to, go back to again and check. Um, you can always refer to the recording that is going to be posted into the Emerge Africa YouTube channel. So thanks everybody for attending and thanks very much again to Andy and Ravi and I'd like to hand back to Jakob at this point. Thanks.